please welcome one of the nicest villains you could ever meet. Please welcome Santino Fontana. Oh, you guys are good for this early in the morning. Right there, sir. Have a mic, I'll flick it on for you. And there you go. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So, just got in from the airport, we'll take it easy on you. It's raining, yes. Let's do it. Yeah, we'll get to your questions in a bit. But I have a couple things for you real quick. So, yes. when you did the film Frozen, what was the audition like? The audition, I was doing uh, Cinderella on Broadway. When I got it, the audition, it was coming with a song. And, uh, and there were like two scenes to read opposite the casting director who flew in from LA. And that led to a callback, which then, then there was a, I think there was a second callback and then they flew me to LA and there was a follow-up audition. And then uh, that was it. What was the song you used? Oh, I sang, so I ended up singing uh, I Feel Pretty, but I changed the lyrics to I Am Pretty because they said that they thought that the character was going to be funny and conceited. Um, yeah, it's pretty fun. So was the atmosphere different auditioning for Disney, safer than any other animation or any other work? Yes, for any other, well... Eh, I mean, for animation, and this, that's the really the only animation I've, or very, I've done very little animation work other than Frozen. I mean, it's the only audition you ever go to where the entire audience or the people listening close their eyes because they don't want to see you. They just want to hear. Does that sound like what we have in our head? So Jamie, who's a friend of mine, the casting director, she closed her eyes when she, and they're recording it just with a microphone as opposed to. Yeah, it's very different than a regular acting audition. Did you get to take a look at what your character looked like? Yes. He, they'd already, they already knew he was going to look the way he ended up looking. I mean, he changed a little bit, but he had red hair, he was tall, all of that stuff was set. So you started in theater. Now, did you have aspirations towards film and TV, or did the opportunities just arise over time? I didn't really. You know, I'm from a small town uh, in Washington State, and there were no people making their livings in the arts. And so I thought, oh, I'll just be a, I was, my goal was just to be a regional theater actor, just to be able to make a living playing parts. So I never really intended on going to New York. I never intended on being in television or film. It all just kind of was the next step, yeah. So it was just theater classes into theater and then it just kept escalating? Well, I still, I mean, I think most, well, I shouldn't say that. Every actor is different, but a lot of my favorite actors, I think most of my favorite actors would say if they had the opportunity as an actor, it, to be on stage is the best thing only because you, get, you have the most control and the most instant feedback. It's rewarding in a way. And film and television is also fantastic. But um, if I had my choice, I'd be in a play any day. So do you find it more challenging, uh, the, the musical theater work? I know you said it's something you prefer, but is it more of a challenge to you? Or is yeah, it just... well, theater is definitely more challenging. You're doing it eight times a week. There's no way to stop. Uh, you're typically contracted for a year. You're working six days a week. You know, the TV work, film work that I've done, which has been great, but you, uh, you know, you're... You work a couple days and then it's done. Frozen, for example, was five days over two and a half years. Five days of work over two and a half years. So, and I was, I was doing, I did, I think, three plays in the process of that time. So it's a crazy difference of workload. How do you, how do you prepare yourself to sing in front of thousands of people? Do you, is there any special mindset that you have for your singing in public? No, I, it's, you know, I, I say to students a lot of the times and they talk about, oh, I get nervous if I'm going on stage or I get nervous when I'm performing. I really try to liken it to, you don't get nervous making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, right? You know what to do. There's two pieces of bread, you do this, you do that. Stay moving forward. Don't, um, you know, stay eyes on the prize, basically. Mm -hmm. But you don't have a thousand people watching you make a sandwich. Yeah, but you know, I, I performed for, I did something at the, uh, um, at the, it's not the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, but it's, I've worked with the Mormon yeah. Tabernacle yeah, Choir in their conference center, which is the largest indoor theater in the world. It's, I think, 20,000, 25,000 yeah. yeah. people. 
And that was a little, that was a little like, what is this? I've never done that. I've also performed in stadiums where I've been asked to sing the national anthem, which is terrifying because there's, you can't really hear. But those are really unique situations. Yeah. For the most part, I prefer audiences of strangers, <laughs> always, than people I know. Yes. So how, how did the large choir, I think it was Mormon Tabernacle Yeah, Mormon how, Tabernacle how did, choir. how did that come about? That seems such an unusual thing to land. Yeah, you're telling me. I was doing a reading with Olympia Dukakis, the, that actress, and I got the offer to do it. And I came back and I said, I got the weirdest offer out of nowhere. And she said, you have to do this. She was like, this is so unique. When else are you going to get to do this? So I did. Yeah. Did you have any different kind of prep for that or just muscle up no, and do it? No, it's like, a, it's most, uh, you know, every gig is different. This, that was, I got a call from the conductor who was lovely. What songs do you want to do? Here are the songs we would like you to do. We'll, you know, create a show around you. I ended up going back with them. I worked with them four times, I think, within a year. Wow. Which was great. One last question about that. Uh, how, many, how much rehearsal goes into that? That's One day. So there's, we set, yeah, any concert gig, it's like you have a sound check. I'm singing with the, um, I'm singing in Iowa coming up in, um, oh, is that October? With an orchestra. I've got an orchestra gig at Carnegie Hall in June. Yeah, it's all like, you come prepared. You better know your stuff. You show up, you do it once with the orchestra, and then the performance typically is either that night or the next day. So when you're doing any kind of live comedic work, like within theater, mm -hmm. uh, do you change your timing much from theater to TV to film? Yes. Yeah. Well, timing in television and film really isn't up to you. It's up to the editor. So even in watching Frozen, I remember watching the first time and thinking, oh, I should have waited a beat. But in reality, it didn't matter if I waited a beat. They're choosing the beats. You know, on stage, we can't lie. Everyone's seeing the same thing. So you have to feel like we're editing live. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, every performance, is, every performance is slightly different, sometimes really different, depending on the audience. Yeah. Uh, what was the premiere of Frozen like? It was cool. There was, I was doing Cinderella. I flew out with my, my parents came, my fiance at the time came, and it was at the El Capitan Theater, you know, right on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. It was like a... It was exactly what you would imagine. It was over the top and cool and really awesome. How much of the film did you see before the premiere? Like, hear your voice and... We saw it once. They flew us all out. We had a, a screening for the cast and everybody was there, except Adina couldn't make it, but the rest of us were all there and we saw a screening before, before the premiere. That was so just that once. Wow. Yeah, and that was also the first time I learned what the story was. Because we all individual. I mean, Kristen knew the whole story because she was in the whole movie. But uh, the rest of us, we just got the little pieces we were in. We never were given the script. So. And what was the audience reaction like? It was great. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to talk about because it's so, such a unique experience hearing your voice come out of something that isn't you, mm -hmm. first of all. And then to have to see audiences react to something that had to have been in, you know, Chris Buck and Jen Lee, the director's heads from the beginning and see that come to life and to be a part of that is a mm -hmm. real gift. Nice. Um, yeah, it's really cool. So you also worked with some Sesame Street characters. Yes, how'd, the, did. how'd that come about? That's through the Mormon Tabernacle really? Choir. Yeah, they were like, do you want to do another concert with us and the Sesame Street Muppets? So I worked with Big Bird and Elmo and Abby Cadabby and uh, Snuffleupagus and The Count and yeah, all of it. It was amazing. It's so, it's, it, yeah, I can't, it's, I'm very lucky. I've been very lucky. Was there very much rehearsal with, with the Sesame Street character? There was more rehearsal than was not, be, than usual. There was like two days, three days maybe. Wow. I know. That's pretty weird. awesome. And there, we made a recording, you can find that wherever you listen to your music, but the uh, Christmas recording. But uh, yeah, it was super, <laughs> just so bizarre and great. You know, the people that I, yeah. like the, the, the actor who voices uh, Cookie Monster is the same actor who voiced Cookie Monster when I was a kid and loved Cookie Monster. 
So he had started right when I was a child. So I was like, you're the cookie monster. Because, you know, over time, people fade away yeah. and they change. But, uh, yeah, it was pretty great. So it was some, actually some original members of the A lot. A lot of original members, yeah. Wow. Was Carol Spinney still doing no, that? No, he, he was still working, but he didn't go on that trip. Okay. They had Matt Vogel who came in, who was fantastic. He's also the voice of... Oscar the Grouch. Yes, good. Yeah, I interviewed him a, a little bit ago before, obviously, this is a while ago. Yeah, He's yeah, a yeah. fantastic interview, an amazing fellow. And there's a documentary on him yes. uh, that I think it's called The Man Who's Big Bird or something like that. It's yeah. a great. Yeah. We're going to get to audience questions. I just have one more for sure. you. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what you're working on now and uh, what is Lost and Found in Cleveland? That's what I was going to say. So Lost and Found in Cleveland is a movie I did last year with Dennis Haysbert and Stacey Keach and June Squibb and Martin Sheen and John Lovitz. It's an amazing cast. Uh, I don't know, you know, we shot it. It's going to, they're hoping to, for it to come out in the fall. We shot it in Cleveland. It's like uh, Best in Show meets, what's the Antiques Roadshow? That's what, yeah. Oh the, the filming is done. It's just in the editing process. They're all in post, yeah. I also just finished a, a, a film that I did with uh, some friends that is called Death Wish that is, will be coming out in festivals. There's another movie called Stalking the Boogeyman that's in festivals with Tommy Sadowski. And, and a comedy that was at Tribeca, which is, was just at Cleveland's uh, film festival called Brenda and Billy and the Pothos Plant, where I play a magician. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Well, let's get to some questions from the audience. But first off, I want to say thank you for being the first Q&A of the day. My I, pleasure. Directly from the airport right to here. Thank you. Got to love you guys. Uh, questions? We have one over here. We got, Wait, we, got, we got time. They are fighting over we who goes first. There's time plenty of time. We're time for both of you. Hi, I'm Andrew. My question is, so you get the opportunity to be one of the best Disney villains out of so many. What's it like going to conventions where you get to work with Jonathan Freeman and the voice of Maleficent and Ken Page and being able to just interact with those guys who are just... Yeah, I'll tell you, I was just in sec. This is, first of all, I'll be honest, this is my second Comic-Con. So I'm still a newbie, be gentle. But the, that, Jonathan Freeman is a friend of mine, and he had reached out to me and said, would you want to do these, you know? And I was like, I don't know, I, why not? You know, the world's on fire, as far as I'm concerned, it looks like. I'm like, why not? And he, so we were in Sacramento a couple of weeks ago, and the, you know, we all had dinner. The four of us had dinner. It was the weirdest, I mean, it was amazing. But I was like, if people knew that Gaston, the Yogi Boogie Man, Hans, and Jafar were having dinner in this hotel, it's so, it sounds like a movie, right? I was like, we should write a script because we all have this huge secret. We all, no one knows who we are. I mean, someone actually did, to be fair. Someone did recognize me from a TV show there, but they didn't, I don't think they knew I'm Prince Hans. So it's like a bizarre, it's just a bizarre club to be in and yet one that I'm very honored to be a part of. Yeah. Awesome. Another question over here. Hi, right, hello, Santino. Santino, great to see you here and have you with us. Thank you. Yep, Prince Hans of the Southern Isles, Michael Dorsey, Dorothy Michaels from Tootsie, and the audiobook narrator for the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Yeah, you should be my agent. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, so my two-part question for you is... What is it that you enjoy about the process of both um, acting, Broadway, and voice acting? How did you feel when you learned that Prince Hans would be the villain of Frozen? And probably all of us are wondering, since the third and fourth Frozen movies have been announced, do you think there's a possibility that Prince Hans may come back for those movies? I think anything is possible. And I think if enough of us pray, it could happen. I think all, no matter, I feel very lucky that I always intended to, I wanted to do everything. I, I'm a, I go after experiences I find. So being able to do audiobooks, I also did a Stephen King audiobook, which I loved. 
uh, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. He did the U audiobooks. That's something that came out of nowhere. And I was like, sure, let's do it. Story t I'm all about storytelling. I'm obsessed with it. When I was a kid on the playground, playing that the sand is lava or the floor is lava, that's my jam, you know? That's when I was like, I just want to do that for the rest of my life and in any format I can find it. So whether that's on stage or on a set or in a sound booth, uh, that's what I'm about. That's what I love. And when I found out that I was actually thrilled about Hans being the villain, we knew, I knew he was going to be the villain. The question was always, at which point is the audience going to know he's the villain? And we did several uh, recordings where that happened at different points. And I always thought I got the best of both worlds. I got to be a, a Disney prince and a Disney villain. Like, those are both check, check. Like, next, that's amazing. I, I, yeah. I got, you know, I won the lottery in that respect. So. Okay. All right, we have another one over here. Hi, my name is Sean. I was just wondering what your experience was like in Cleveland. I loved Cleveland. I'd actually, you know, the funny thing, I'd never been to Cleveland, and then I did two jobs. I got a call from a director who was working on a new play, a Sherlock Holmes play, at the Cleveland Playhouse. We flew out with some, I flew out with some friends. We did a reading of a play. I was like, Cleveland, wow, I'd done it, great. Then I got a call, like, hey, you want to do this movie in Cleveland? I was like, this is so weird. Why all these Cleveland things? And I went back for a couple months and did a movie in Cleveland. I loved it. I loved Jack's Casino. Yeah? Exactly. Yeah, you got one? Actually, I have a question. You, you just mentioned playing a magician. Yeah. Did you actually learn any routines? Or no. Or you just... I, no. Total faker. I, I so, I, a friend of mine, when I was doing Tootsie, the Sarah Stiles, who was on Billions, and she's been in a bunch of TV shows that you would, you would recognize her from. She was also in Tootsie with me. This, the pandemic happened. And we were like, what are we gonna do? I was like, we gotta do something. And so we reached out to the associate director of Tootsie, he was also a writer. And I was like, she was like, I wanna play somebody who kills someone. And I said, I wanna play a magician, but one of those like cool magicians, like Chris Angel. I was like, I wanna play one of those people. And so he wrote this script where she, where siblings, you're gonna be able to find it online very soon, but, uh, I bring our mother back to life after she kills her. Uh, it's fun. Yeah. That, I've never learned that trick. No. <laughs> <laughs> Question in the second row. All right. I thought you were brilliant and horrifying on Fosse Verdon oh. because you were so real. And, and very evil. Where did that come from? <laughs> Thank you. You should be my agent with him. I was doing, what was I doing? I was in a play, I was doing something. And you know, it's kind of what I said about the being on the playground. I've avoided an identity my whole life. My children are starting to kind of ruin that. But I want to keep, I want to keep people guessing. You know? you know, I played Prince Charming in Cinderella at the same year that I played Prince Hans. The opposite people. And so when they called about Fosse Verdon, I was like, wait, this guy's a rapist. I'm playing a rapist who lived, who was an, a real man. And the daughter, Bob Fosse's daughter, who was a producer, Nicole, she was on the set. And I remember getting on the set and she, there was a lot of weird energy coming from her. And she was like, hi, nice to meet you. I was like, I am not him. I am just playing him. And I don't do anything. Act I mean, it's implied, but no, I love doing that. And it was a, a directed by, that episode was directed by a friend of mine uh, who was at my wedding, actually, who lives right by me in New York. And he was like, it's great that you get to do this slimy, yeah. And actually, never, I never watched it. I'm not great at watching myself, but I'm glad you said that. Thank you. Any other questions? Right in front. Um, I've seen a couple of your Broadway shows, and I'm curious, what is your favorite song that you sang on Broadway? Uh, ooh, that's tricky. I think the best, I loved singing Do I Love You uh, Because You're Beautiful from Cinderella. I think that's a pretty great, pretty great song. And I got to do, I got to be the first person to sing it on Broadway, so I was very lucky, yeah. Okay. 
I have a question going back to theater. Yeah. How much of the film Tootsie did you watch to get the uh, character? And have you ever met Dustin Hoffman and ever get any feedback from him? No. I never met Dustin Hoffman. I never got any feedback from him. The movie, when I got the call from the director saying, hey, I want you to read something. It's uh, this Broadway. They're, tr they're trying to make Tootsie into a Broadway musical. Will you read it? And I didn't, I had seen the movie when I was a kid, but it came out the year I was born. So I, I wasn't like a thing in my life. I watched it then and I was like, that's a great part. I don't know how you're gonna turn that into a musical, but that's a great part. And, uh, and then we did nine workshops and readings of it as it kept changing. And, uh, but I never went back to the movie. I did go back to the screenplay written by Larry Gal Galbert, which is genius. Yeah. And I, ref I referred to that when we were making changes, but Robert Horn, who wrote the book to the musical and then won a Tony Award for it, uh, I think he took the best stuff from the screenplay and then did his own thing with it, yeah. How long did that run? Uh, about a year, we did, we were in Chicago for a few months, then we ran for about a year, and then we closed in January, and then the pandemic was in March. So we lucked out, because everybody that was still working on Broadway when the pandemic happened, they all got sick. All my friends got sick. So we lucked out in that respect. All right, another question? Yeah, I have one. You, you just talked about playing a rapist in a film, which, you know, someone has to do it. Are, are there roles that you draw the line? It's like, yeah, I'll play a rapist, I'll play this type of person, but I won't play this one. And conversely, is there a role you really want to play? You know, I don't, and this is something I should bring up in therapy, I don't think there is a part I wouldn't play. It, or I don't think, someone, a, a casting director asked me that once. They'd see me in a couple plays, and they're like, is, like, is a pedophile cross the line? And I was like, no, no, I'm fine with that. <laughs> Not because I'm pro-pedophile, but because <laughs> I think my job is to play people so that we can all experience all the different extremes of humanity. That's why I'm into, that's why I do this. Um, yeah, storytelling, story it's, you know, I love it. I don't think there is. That said, and I can't be specific, but there are things that I've been offered where, recently actually, just within the last week, something where I was like, well, I don't know if I need video of that out there, of me doing that, and not knowing enough, here's the trick. You're giving, in a film or a television show, you are giving so much power to people you don't know in the editor and the director who you may have a relationship with, but ultimately it's their film. You're giving them opportunities to cut it however they want. And if you're doing something that could be done terribly, you're putting yourself at risk of something being out there forever, which can be scary. So there are some things that I've been like, I don't, I don't want to risk doing that on camera without knowing what it is, yeah. And I was backstage, but I heard you say this is like one of your first Comic-Cons? Second, this is my second. And, and what's your experience like with this? Are you surprised by the... Uh... Yes, everything. <laughs> yes, I'm totally surprised. I've never been to one as like a fan, and I've never been to, I mean, this is my second one ever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but like I said, I'm an experienced, Guy. Like, I'm all about trying stuff. So, yeah, why not? Yeah. So, so any last questions? Uh, right down front here. I'm on my way. On Get my way. steps in. Hi, I'm Mona. About Chrissy Bell. I don't know. I don't know how I was working with Kristen Bell on. Oh, she's great. Kristen, I was texting with her yesterday. She's fantastic. She's the only person in Frozen that I... Uh, recorded with in person. Oh. So the, the third, you know, again, there were five sessions over two and a half years. One of those sessions, I flew out to LA. I did my mat matinee on a Sunday, I flew out to LA. I met with Kristen. We had, I think we had Zoomed, had we Zoomed? We had, we knew people in common. We had the same manager at one point. So we knew each, we'd met. And uh, she was eight months pregnant which on her is a, is a thing, because yeah. she's <laughs> very short. And uh, we recorded the song together uh, while she was pregnant. Uh -huh. um, but that was it. And then, uh, and I've seen her since. She, we actually got to sing at Carnegie Hall 
together. We sang Love is an Open Door at Carnegie Hall two years ago, which was her first time. Uh, she's lovely. She's everything you would imagine and more. She's really great. So I know you just came in from the airport. Are you going to your table to sign now? Or are you taking a little break? Yes. Yes. My You're... handler says yes. I do what they tell me. So you are going to your table to sign. Awesome. Well, you're a trooper. Thank you Right very from much. the airport. Oh, one more question back here. Fire away. Let... Yeah, I did have one. Um, you're here at a con. You're going to meet a lot of people who have a lot of passions. Comic collecting, autograph collecting, whatever the case might be. What are your passions outside of work? Yeah, this is hard. I mean, this is because my passion is what I do. You know, storytelling. I mean, I'm obsessed. It's sad. It's not great. I mean, I'm obsessed with... Uh, I love uh, storytelling. That's my, and also I will say, since I've become a father, I have a, two young daughters. That's clearly the winner. Uh, and trying to balance those two passions now is my, you know, what I'm dealing with. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. And thank you guys. One of the nicest villains you could ever meet. <laughs> Give it up. Oh, there we go. The first standing ovation of the day. Santino Fontana headed back to his table to sign. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Thank you.